Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, celebrate Native Plant Week with Gayata Ajilusk in her latest book, Butterfly Gardening for Texas. See how to attract resident and migratory butterflies and keep them around. On tour, see how Anne Bellamy exchanged a lifeless yard for vibrant native habitat. And John Drongle has your backyard basic tips. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. Even in a small yard or patio garden, it's easy to create a wildlife habitat. See how Ann Bellamy turned a lifeless yard into vibrant headquarters for creatures. No matter the season or time of day, Ann Bellamy can spot something new in her garden every hour. The habitat she created for herself and the wildlife is far more enriching than the yard that came with the house. The front yard was a regular lawn with um, pecan trees and boxwood and mandina, uh, a few shrubs. Um, the backyard was pretty much dead grass and um, one sad little area with some dying perennials, but that was it. It was pretty much um, hot and dead. I wanted to walk outdoors and be surprised. Um, and this garden is different, tremendously different seasonally, very different day to day, and even from morning to afternoon, because it's not just the plants, it's also the animals. And so by life, I wanted the insects, I wanted the butterflies, the birds. When I started in the back and I had this small area, I was so delighted by it that that's how come things kept getting to be more and more and I eventually had the courage to decide I was going to work on the front yard. <laughs> but at first I started with the back and I thought nobody's going to see this and I can try different things and learn. And I would have taken lots of different kinds of training which I very much appreciate. Habitat steward training was the first and um, that's through the City of Austin National Wildlife Federation and also Travis Audubon. And that was excellent training and now I give talks to that group. And then I took Master Naturalist, um, Capillary and Master Naturalist training. I took um, Master Gardener training. I took classes at Go Native U um, at the Wildflower Center. And I'm continually learning. One thing she learned was how to deal with her red death soil. It took practice. Now I sort of know what to do. And I, I put some decomposed granite, I put some compost, I put a little bit of manure, I mix it all up with the, with the clay. And slowly the clay is, it's becoming more alive, more permeable. Designer Kathy Northrum designed the front yard paths and suggested plant layout. She also suggested berms for the backyard. And then I just like an undulating surface. It's just more, prettier and also it allows, again, bringing in some soil that's got better drainage. The combination of berms and improved soil allowed her to diversify for perpetual wildlife food and habitat. I started small with my planting, and then things moved and I tried something over here and tried something over there. It evolved over time and actually what happened was, I mean, I knew that I needed certain paths just to get in and out of the house and through the gate and things like that, and those were wider paths. But then the rest of them, um, as plants grew, they took over the wider paths and the paths got narrower. Eventually, she worked with designer Scott Thurman to widen and clarify navigation with stone paths. Scott added more berms and extended Anne's first one, giving it some bold performers for vertical counterpoint. The front yard was a slightly different challenge. Again, there's sort of sunshade. Kathy Nordstrom tackled the issues, towering pecan trees and dry shade. 
One thing I did was um, also open up the pecan trees a little bit to allow in a little more sun so they're not, it wasn't dense, dense shade. And that's actually an ideal situation is to have sort of filtered sunlight. To provide nectar food, Anne found the flowering perennials that perform in that niche. and contrast floppy shapes with structural ones. In front, she wanted more formal paths. Without sacrificing clear-cut direction, she evokes a mood to wander, not barrel through. I think just everything done in, with curves works better. And that includes the sidewalks, and um, just everything is, is just more gentle and, and um, has more interest. Strategically placed garden art accents each journey. I grew up in Panama, and um, so you'll notice that the garden has a little bit of a Latin influence in, uh, in some, partly in the plants, there are some Mexican plants, and then partly in the artwork. Plus, a lot of the artwork you'll notice are animals, so it fits in with the theme of habitat. To ensure wildlife food, and installed drip irrigation on a timer to water her normally drought-hardy plants once a week when rainfall eludes the garden in extreme heat. Water management included flooding on her downhill site. With French drains, dry creek beds, and gutters, she keeps water in the garden and not under the house. On one demon flooding slope, Kathy Nordstrom suggested plants for a rain garden. The rain garden is an area that only gets wet during a rain. So the plants there have to be able to sit in water during a rain, you know, after a rain event, but then they, it also dries up. So they have to be able to handle both. Designing a garden that connects with nature is not just a makeover in style, it's one of philosophy. Well, it's food, water, and shelter for um, all the creatures of Central Texas or the ones that are migrating through. Lots of migrants come through, whether it's insects or birds. And, um, and that's, to me, a lot of the life in the garden isn't, isn't just the plants. It's all these other creatures. And I think that we all want to do our small, small things that we can do to make the planet a better place. And I think it, I guess my passion is to create habitat. I want a living garden. Now, that means you have to be tolerant of change, lots of change, and things don't always bloom when you want them to. Things look, things go dormant, um, but it's not a sterile garden and it's full of surprises. And it's hospitable and, um, you know, I feel the pain of so much urbanization is taking away um, habitat. This is a very tiny oasis, but hopefully other people will do it as well. And, um, we can make a difference. The wonderful opportunity with the garden is you can be original. And I think that would be very exciting. This is partly what people are afraid of, is to show their originality. Um, and so you can do sort of the standard palette of evergreen shrubs and lawn and two trees in the front yard and you're done. Uh, it's not very original, but it's you look like everybody else. and. Um, and so it's not too scary. It's a little scarier to be original, but I welcome people to, if their interest is herbs, do herbs, or if their interest is vegetable gardening, do vegetable gardening, or if their interest are native plants, there may be certain plants they prefer, um, but to go ahead and express themselves. Thanks for opening your garden gates for us. And now we're going to be talking about a really comprehensive and exciting new book about butterfly gardening in Texas. And I'm really happy to introduce Gayata Ajilask. And uh, I've been an admirer of your work for decades. Uh, your uh, books on Texas wildflowers and butterflies have been amazing. Welcome to Central Texas Gardener. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it, your new book is really authoritative and comprehensive. It, did you set out to do all things butterfly in one book? <laughs> I did. Um, I, I, I started uh, noticing that there was a lot of books and butterfly gardens and stuff um, in Britain. Mm -hmm. And um, 
but I couldn't find anything for the United States. And I said, okay, I think they need one. Well, and you, so, you delivered. <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, planted a huge trial butterfly garden. Mm -hmm. And so it just developed from there. Well, it, and it shows. I mean, the book has not only information about the right plants and the, the butterflies themselves, but it has really comprehensive lists. It has a suggested landscape plantings for different regions of, of uh, Texas and in, the south, in, the, in our region. Really uh, quite amazing in, in terms of all the preparation that went into this. So it, it really is a one-stop shop. I congratulate you on that. Well, thank you. Now, I want to dive in and just start talking about why pe this phenomenon of butterfly gardening is caught on and what is it that we humans can do for butterflies? I think it has caught on. I think people were ready for something new. They, they've been birding for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And along about the time that, that I wrote the book, the, the native plant, people are into native, using native plants mm -hmm. now with all the drought and everything. They're, right. they're going back to that. And I think they were looking for something new, some, something of interest uh, for the butterflies. Mm -hmm. What you can do for the butterflies mm -hmm. is, of course, butterflies are kind of like people. They're looking for food. <laughs> And so for, to provide the nectar that the adults need and the larval food plants for, for the larvae right. uh, is going to get them into the garden. Food and the other things human need is water and shelter, right? They, they do. Uh, n water, of course, is, is important, but it's when you see butterflies puddling mm -hmm. and things like that, it, uh, or a group of butterflies in, mm -hmm. in one place. That's usually the males, and they're there for uh, minerals and salts and okay. things like that that, that they're getting okay. instead of just pure water. Okay. Now um, I understand that some flowers work better than others for attracting butterflies, and you have particular flower colors that you like too. You like the pinks, right? Uh, it's not me that likes them. Oh, the it, butterflies. It's, it's, it's the butterflies' preference, and their preference. Um, Studies have shown that they go to uh, lavender, pink, uh, white, and yellow, hmm. and then to blue. There's three things that uh, that's going to attract the butterflies to the garden. And first off, it's going to be color and fragrance because okay. they can they can smell for a long distance. I, you never, I never, would never have thought of the, the fragrant aspect of that. Uh, absolutely, it absolutely. Makes sense, though, yes, it? yes. They, they pick up the fragrance, and mm -hmm. then as they get nearer, they see the color, and that draws them into the yard. The thing that's going to keep them there is the nectar. Okay. So. And um, some of the plants have developed a really uh, complex ways of helping guide the the butterflies in, right? They they have, and all of this has been, um, of course, for for the plants, it's pollination, mm -hmm. and it was uh, they the the plants developed it mostly for the bees, mm -hmm. but they have nectar, what they call nectar guides, and um, the butterflies see totally different from what we see. They're they're seeing different colors and, mm -hmm. and everything. They can see more than we can see. So they can see these nectar guides, which is a different color. Right. And some some of them are a circle around the, the throat of the plant. Mm -hmm. Some of them are long streaks on the lower petals. Well, or for example, like dots. on the desert willows, for example, have the, be the beautiful distinctive kind of guide mark. They do. In. Yeah. yeah. One of my all-time favorite plants. Yeah. And the devil's claw is, mm -hmm. is really great with that lower lip with with the nectar guides on. It's kind of like a little landing platform <laughs> for an airplane. Right. You know, right. The airstrip. All it's it's amazing how Mother Nature is. Uh, kind of cooperated, you know, all the different species yeah, have aligned. It's, 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 I think they've all evolved together, you of know. Course, of course, Because in the beginning, um, eons ago, the nectar wasn't in the throat mm -hmm. of the flower. It was, it was um, places along the stem or on mm -hmm. the leaves or sure. all of this kind of stuff. And so eventually it got down to, you know, let's, let's make good use of this for right. pollination. All so. right. Well, there, uh, there, in terms of the nectar, there are different factors uh, uh, as well in terms of time of day, if the flowers aged, and mm -hmm. uh, those sorts of things, right? It does. Uh, different plants produce different amounts of nectar. It all starts with the soil because, mm -hmm. you know, just 
with people, you are what you eat. Right, right. And, and the plants are what they take up, mm -hmm. the, the, the moisture and, and chemicals, the minerals and stuff that, mm -hmm. that they have. Right. So it all starts with the soil. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things, I'll, I'll throw this in, about native plants. Right. When people bring native plants in and put it into a really rich soil and everything, the nectar content is going to change. It may be better, it mm -hmm. may produce more, it may produce less. Mm -hmm. So you just have to kind of watch your native plants on, okay. on that. Try to replicate the soil conditions that anyone naturally Absolutely go into. Absolutely better, as, okay. as close as you can. Until, you know, you might try, try them in both situations mm -hmm. and see which works the best. Mm -hmm. The sun, of course, is in, in warmth mm -hmm. is, is going to affect the nectar a lot, but there's wind and um, the temperature and everything. All the weather stuff, right. Nectar is basically four different sugars, and um, they even produce a different amount of nectar at different times of the day. Hmm. So at one time of the day, you'll see the butterflies nectaring on this plant. At another time of the day, you'll see them nectaring more on this one. So it's very variable in mm -hmm. there. And uh, you just have to kind of watch the butterflies and see what they're doing and see what they like. Sure, sure. Well, and that's the reason why we we do all this to begin with, right? Is to observe and uh, to have these beautiful yeah. creatures come so that we can encounter them. Now, let's talk about um, uh, the, uh, some plants that people should be thinking about that will kind of play out through the course of the year. Uh, in the springtime, there are a lot of great flowering trees like Mexican plum. I, that's what, something I think about. Yeah, the Mexican plum, the spice bush is mm. really, really good. Uh, red bud mm -hmm. is good. Uh, the wild um, here, the escarpment cherry. Yeah. Is, See a is, lot is a of good those. Yes. Yeah. So those are some of the trees. Mm -hmm. um, of course, in, in, in the springtime, we've just got all kinds of good herbaceous stuff right. uh, to, to choose from. Right. You know, I, I, I always see visitors on my Turk's cap. Turk's cap is especially good for, for the uh, sulfurs. Mm -hmm. They, for some reason, they like that. Uh, the Turk's cap is, the, the flower, of course, the, the petals stand up, mm -hmm. which, which makes it the, the um, Butterflies that use that need a, a longer proboscis mm -hmm. to get down to the nectar. Right. Uh, some some of the larger swallowtails and and the larger sulfurs mm -hmm. are really um, they really like the Turks cap. What are a few of your other favorite things to kind of stretch out the seasons, if you will? Ah, uh, for for the summer you can't beat things like tithonia, the, the Mexican sunflower. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. And pintas mm -hmm. and. Uh, of course, the old stand by the butterfly bush. Mm -hmm. There's another. There's one that um, it's just recently been used in Austin. It's the sweet almond verbena, mm -hmm. and it's it's a close cousin to our native bee brush, right. the aloysia. Right. That's really 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 good. Another one is the um, Argentina uh, verbena, mm -hmm. bonarensis. Sometimes okay. it's called the tall verbena. Right. But right. It's excellent for butterflies. Great. Great. Well, even some weeds like thistle uh, are oh. great. <laughs> <laughs> thistle is absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's really, really good. Of course, once you get it, you've got it for life. <laughs> <laughs> you beware. <laughs> Buyer yeah. beware. Yeah. I think they're beautiful plants, but they're they a little are. tough to garden around. They are. Right, but they're good. Right. And you know, it's, it's a larval food plant mm -hmm. um, for the painted lady. Mm -hmm. Well, the, bu the book it contains information tons of information, not just about the plants, but how to organize the plants and put them together in, in a way that was going to work for the butterflies. Let's talk about the shelter aspect a little bit, and, mm. uh, and that's especially important in the wintertime, isn't it? Well, in the wintertime, the, the shelter you need for, for the butterflies that hibernate, mm -hmm. um, that, that uh, spend their winters in, in the adult form, and they definitely need shelter, you know, to, to keep them from freezing to death, to death. But shelter in the summertime is very important too because a butterfly has to regulate its temperature. It can't sweat like we do and, and everything. So when they get overheated, they need to go to the shade. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, why a lot of times you'll see a butterfly underneath the leaf, right. hanging exactly. underneath the leaf right. is Just, to cool off. Yes. They also do it by turning their wings uh, 
straight up to the sun. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's there's different ways that they do that. But shelter is, is in, during storms, mm -hmm. um, a lot of butterflies drowned. Uh, they're knocked loose from their support. Mm -hmm. and, and so they fall to the ground and drown. So shelter is definitely important. All right, all right. Well, in addition to pl providing uh, the plants and the nectar, a lot of people like to put out fruit bowls as well and things like that, and that can attract large numbers of different species. Some species, mm -hmm. uh, especially the, the things like um, the hackberry, the morning cloak, um, some of the ladies, the buckeyes, mm -hmm. and of what they do to, to do that the fruit needs to be really old, fermented okay. fruit fermented, is good. Yeah, right. fermented. <laughs> Mashed bananas, peaches, plums, any mm. of that, that soft fruit is really, really right. good. Right. And um, you can mix it up with a little bit of molasses mm. and, and what they really like is maybe add some stale beer. <laughs> and, and Who doesn't really love like the that? mashup of, of <laughs> rotten fruit and stale beer? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know, one of the things, if, if you look under pear, pear mm -hmm. trees and um, persimmons and mm -hmm. things like that, you'll notice the... Um, okay, the butterflies there. And yeah. of course, the book has loads of images and information about the many different species of butterflies. Uh, and I know that you probably have, we could go, we could spend another day or two talking about all of those different varieties, but we really want to recommend your book and commend it uh, to our, our viewers out there because it, it is right now the most comprehensive thing I've seen on butterfly gardening that exists for our nation. So uh, congratulations to you and thank you for all the hard work that went into it. Well, thank you. All right. Well, uh, Gayata, thank you again for being on the on the program. Long overdue. Great to see you. And coming up next, it's John Drongle with Backyard Basics. Hello, gardening friends. Welcome to Backyard Basics. Well, you already know this is dry out there. We're in a drought, pretty serious. And yet we want to save our trees and some of our other shrubs that we planted. We have a big investment out there. And so um, on those days that you can water in your area, I think that it would be good to um, water properly and use that water properly. And so the trees are the main thing that we want to save. If nothing else, save your trees. Watering techniques uh, around trees include using this little yellow sprinkler right here. This is a very nice one. You can see that little slit in the top of it. That sends water up in a spiral right near the middle of the plant. It spirals up and then it comes out of the sides, of course, naturally. Now we've covered a nice big area uh, the way it should be. What you need to do, though, is leave it there long enough so that the moisture goes down at least five inches. It's important, and sometimes it takes a while to get down to those five inches, especially the first time. A lot of arborists don't necessarily recommend this, but this long tube right here in front of me can hook to your hose and then drive a little bit of water out of the tip and open it up down there, open that soil up. Go ahead and assist this to get that water down there deeper. And when you put some compost on there, a very important part of this whole deal, because compost is like a sponge and will hold moisture in there better. And that's the natural way to take care of a tree anyway. So that compost will leach down in there. When we do that, we don't need to go very deep. We just want to go those few inches that'll help us out. So don't go destroying the root system, but open up the soil a little bit. You don't have to do that that often, but I think it's helpful on that first go around. There are other sprinklers that you can use in the zones around trees and shrubs. These small ones right here work just right. If you're out buying one, you'll see in this corner over here that there are different patterns. Some of them are rectangular, some of them are round, and some of them are square like this blue one right here. So take a look at it. They're not all the same, and depending on the area that you're trying to water, um, take a good look at that. That'll make all the difference in the world. You ever walked off and forgot that the water was on? I know what you mean. We've done that too. And so um, you, you need to conserve water at that point also. And these little timers, these timers are excellent. For those persons that are forgetful, I'm one of those, I think I need to go out there and set it. Uh, this one right here with the yellow base to it is one that you can uh, just wind up. It doesn't have batteries, it doesn't have a lot of thinking, and so you just kind of wind the darn thing up, and then it's slowly going to uh, turn off. 
That way, if you uh, forget about it, well, it's not a great big problem. Soaker hoses are also one of those things that you can use. The regulations in these different communities allow you to use the soaker hoses. And that's a good way to slowly put water down in the soil too. Around a tree, you want to make sure that you put several times of hose. Just circle it several times and in and outside of the canopy, right at the drip line mainly, give it a good soaking. Some folks are accustomed to taking the hose and laying it out there. And uh, it'll dig a hole in the ground that water coming out just dust digs a hole and it doesn't spread it. This device right here, this little bubbler, helps the water go out in different areas much more nicely and uh, covers it um, easily. So these are a few things that may be helpful for you in conserving water. The drought is here, the rains are coming, but in the meantime, let's save our trees and landscape. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgool. I'll see you next time. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and visit us on Facebook. Next week, meet Brent Heath from Brent and Becky's Bulbs. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.